Perfect. Okay, so we're going to get started now, everybody. Um, hello and welcome to today's SEDS Online seminar. A big thank you, as always, to the IAS, uh, who sponsors the SEDS Online group and allows us to offer all of these awesome resources for free. And I know I popped on the SEDS Online seminars last week without any sort of introduction. So um, as a few people have asked, my name is Chelsea Pedersen and I work at the Ruhr University Bochum in Germany and I am a carbonate sedimentologist as is um, our guest today, Kathy Hollis. So Kathy is a reader in petrophysics and production geology at the University of Manchester. She specializes in diagenesis and pore system analysis. After completing her bachelor studies at University of Birmingham, she got her PhD from University of Aberdeen, where she focused on burial diagenesis and hydrocarbon dynamics in limestone. She's really actually spent a lot of time at sort of the intersection of academia and industry. And um, one thing that she, she did was work at Shell and she was a carbonate team leader and expert in carbonate diagenesis. So if you wanna know about the development and quantification of pore systems and how these things react during uh, various stages of burial, then she's really your gal. So I'm sure we're in for a great talk um, for today as she gives us a user guide to carbonate sediments. And with that, Kathy, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Chelsea. And uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to give this um, uh, talk. This is Stephen invited me to give this at SEDS Online, having been invited along to my uh, inaugural lecture back in July. And I've adapted it. It's not exactly the same. Um, I've put in a few things, taken a few out. I'm very much very conscious of the fact that many of you here have got a lot of experience in carbonates, perhaps even some of you um, a lot more than I have, but there are also here people who have very limited experience in carbonate, but I'm um, trusting that most of you are sedimentologists, whereas where I gave this talk before, there was a lot of non-geologists in the room. So because it was, uh, it stems from inaugural, there's a little bit of a retrospective in it, um, but, but really what I wanted to do was try and explore what we, what we know about carbonate rocks at the moment. And I can't cover everything, but uh, I'm gonna try and touch on at least some of the issues that have um, evolved over the last 10 or 15 years, because I think it's been a very exciting time for carbonate geoscience, um, uh, both in, the, in terms of what we are doing here in the UK, but also internationally and the amount of international collaboration um, that's been going on. So, I'm going to start with um, what I thought actually was something completely non-geological, but um, Stephen's just told me that uh, Escher's brother was a geologist, so unintentionally I've, I've created a link here by putting this image up. Um, I'll come back to why in a moment, um, but what I thought I'd do, this isn't really a traditional talk that has several sections to it, it <laughs> I hope it doesn't come across as too, too rambling, but what I wanted to do was try and get across really the interconnectivity um, of carbonate sedimentology. This is not a subject that can be studied in isolation. Um, we, we need to not just think about sedimentology, we need to think about diagenesis, we need to think about structural geology, we need to think about rock physics, um, and we need to also be very conscious of scale. And many of these things often get neglected. Um, and certainly, um, through my career as a, both an industry um, geologist and also as an academic, I've seen many people who prefer quite understandably to focus on specific aspects, whether it be sedimentology or structural geology and practice and so forth. But one of the biggest developments to my mind of the last sort of 10 or 15 years has been the, um, the work that's developed around process um, science and thinking about how individual processes and combinations of processes lead us to a better understanding of the product. And that's really the point of this picture here. We can all look at this image, we can all see birds, maybe we can all see fish, but we don't always see them both at the same time. And it's important when we start looking at carbonate rocks to really take that step back. Sort of thing you were told as an undergraduate geology, step back, um, take a big look, look at the big picture, but then zoom in and look at the detail. And so I'm going to try and address this by thinking about, first of all, what, what, the, problems is, what the problems are with carbonates. Why do people maybe not like them? Or why, why are they nervous about them? Um, what are the things that we have to be concerned about? And I'm thinking specifically here about diagenesis because that's really where my heart is. Um, and then I'm going to talk through some of the work that we've done. Um, and I, I mean, very much mean we here. There's lots of work through lots of collaboration over the years. 
on the controls on carbonate sedimentation um, and then subsequently on dogmatization. So at face value, two very different things, but again, quite closely interrelated. Um, and I'm going to do that by sort of working through my, my own career um, and my own thought process um, as best I can. And uh, then I'm going to finish with a little bit of a look forward and where I feel carbonate geoscience has an application. So maybe not so much the sort of future of the science itself, but certainly the future of the applications of science. So many of us who work in carbonates um, do so uh, for, because we love geology, we love um, perhaps paleontology, we love looking at, at, at rocks, we look, we look at, uh, uh, at their components, perhaps because we look at diagenesis. I do notice a, a commonality amongst many carbonate geologists in that they like warm tropical seas and for those of you who've done our undergraduate carbonate geoscience you know that most carbonates form in in very warm tropical areas where there's um, uh, average seawater temperatures of around 20 degrees centigrade or more uh, usually between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn today um, really where, where, where we have uninterrupted light and we all can go swimming and diving and um, and kayaking. And many of us, of course, love doing all of those things. Um, sometimes we can even find carbonates when we go swimming in colder waters. And carbonates are not just restricted to these shallow warm water areas. Um, the Isle of Mull doesn't have many carbonates, but it does have some very nice clean carb white carbonate beaches nearby. And there are, of course, cold water corals that we see today. And of course, most of us also understand how limestones form, primarily from accumulation of skeletal debris, um, from accumulation of non-skeletal grains such as ooids, um, and from the breakdown of algae, micrite, um, uh, micritization processes, and in intertidal areas um, through microbial processes, microbial mats that we see here. Um, at, at this point, I'm just going to put my pointer on if I can. Um, sorry. Uh, um, we're here. Uh, in, in Abu Dhabi. And one thing we've learned a lot of in the last few years, um, or the last, again, last 15 years, is that microbial processes are fundamentally important, not just in marine environments, but also in freshwater environments, and that large volumes of carbonate can be precipitated from freshwater as well in lacustrine systems and also at hot springs and within waterfalls through direct precipitation. I'm not going to say any more about that. This is uh, too big a subject for today and not an area that I'm particularly well, well versed in. So I'm going to stick to marine carbonates for now, just to try and keep things reasonably simple. Um, and of course, because um, carbonates are made up not just of, of grains, um, they have changed quite significantly through time. And this is quite important to many of the things that I'm going to be saying today. Um, we have um, carbonates that have precipitated um, way back in the Precambrian and the Infocambrian by microbial processes um, through um, microbial mediation. And then as we come through time, we move into periods where we have um, perhaps in, in the fairly recent uh, reefs that look very similar to the ones we see today. In the past, um, the, the skeletal architecture is very, very different. But as well as evolution, we've seen fluctuations in carbon dioxide concentrations and seawater chemistry, both of which are closely related through time. And this has also had a fundamental impact on the, um, uh, the composition and the reactivity of the rock um, and even influences um, the pore systems that develop. So very basic view. Why, why are we interested in, in limestones, apart from the fact that they, they, they're they're a, a fascinating uh, record of the past. They host mineralization, they host hydrocarbon. Many of you probably have worked or are working in the hydrocarbon industry. Um, carbonates are very important reservoirs for oil and gas. They're also very important aquifers, um, like whether it be for hot water springs or for fresh water or for drinking water. Um, and they've made many of our buildings um, and less attractively, they're also important for road, stone and cement. But they're also of enormous importance to the carbon cycle. And I referred back to um, a moment ago to the, to the fluctuations in PCO2 that we've had in the atmosphere through time in the past. Um, and, and a very, very important component of the carbon cycle is the sink 
that carbonate precipitation provides for atmospheric CO2. Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, in some of the slides I have in a moment. But just to refresh you um, uh, with the carbon cycle, we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from a whole range of processes, some of them anthropogenic, and some of them natural. Um, and that carbon dioxide exchange with the world's oceans can lead to precipitation of calcium carbonate shells, which sink to the seafloor, create carbonate platforms. So hold that one in your mind. Hold also in your mind this uh, plot of uh, carbon atmospheric CO2 um, over the last uh, 40 or 50 years and the fairly uh, exponential rate in which it's increased. So first problem with, with carbonates, not a problem as far as I'm concerned, but for many people, um, they're put off by the fact they're so reactive. And this means that for, for rocks that are mineralogically very, very simple, um, far more simple than a, a plastic sedimentary rock, um, the resultant pore textures, fabrics, um, crystallinity is very, very complicated simply because of the reactivity of calcium carbonate. And this means that we can create um, pores that might be very small. I'm going to talk about this a bit more in a minute. They may be nanoscale. We can create pores that we can stand in. Um, and I'm not very tall, but this is a good indication of the size of some of the pores that we might have um, as a cave system um, that's in a dolomite. So we can get cave systems in dolomite as well as limestone um, that's uh, many, many meters in size. Um, to scale cavern systems. And those cavern systems are often very much controlled by the underlying structural geology. So when we think about diagenesis and pore systems, we also have to think about structural geology because faults and fractures will control how fluids flow. We can get reaction by carbonate sediment from the moment it's deposited on the seafloor. These are marine cements within an Ordovician um, platform. And uh, you can see that very quickly, um, carbonate rocks start to cement themselves up on the sea floor. They also become altered by biogenic processes. Um, they can become dolomatized very early on. Um, again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, um, where they completely recrystallize, completely change their pore structure, and then it suddenly stops. And here we have an ancient reaction front between a dolomite and a limestone. And this is something that really has received very, very little attention, and I will try and find enough time to say a little bit more about. So essentially, the challenge that we have is trying to characterize rocks that change from the minute that they're deposited right through to the, um, uh, the deep burial environment and back up to the surface, and on many, many different scales, from the nano scale to the meter or even to the kilometer scale. And so this is just an example here of some corroded micrite, which has uh, created a solution enhanced uh, microporosity. And so to do this, we have to use a very wide range of data sources. Um, obviously, we all like going out in the field. Many of us haven't had the opportunity to do this for too long now and getting a little bit frustrating, but um, this is uh, some outcrop work we were doing in um, Morocco a couple of years ago. Uh, we can look at drill core, um, which is uh, a very nice way of looking at uh, clean, um, well-cut pieces of, of rock, and, and we can describe the sedimentology and the, the diagenetic overprint. On a large scale, we can look at seismic data. Um, interpreting seismic data in carbonates has its challenges, but sometimes you're lucky enough to get some really nice data like this. But we also have to look on a much smaller scale, and we have to take samples of rock that we believe are representative of even areas of lack of alteration um, to look at under the microscope on a centimeter scale. Um, under the backscatter electron image um, such as this where we can look on the micron scale, um, we can maybe take x-rays um, and we can also conduct geochemistry which is what I'm trying to show here um, and there's a whole range of geochemical proxies we can use to understand how um, limestones and dolomites have changed and I'm, not, I'm going to keep off the geochemistry today but much of what I'm going to present to you does have some um, significant work behind it um, in terms of isotopic trace element analysis. Um, so all this means is that we really need to think from the beginning, whatever we're doing on a sedimentary basin scale. So even for those projects where you're working on geochemical analysis, of very small samples of calcite or um, dolomite, we need to be thinking about what was going on on the big scale and working in. And by this, I mean the basin scale, because the basin scale is controlling many, many things. Controlling fundamentally which fluids interact 
um, with sediments, which fluids, um, how those sediment um, fluid pathways um, have evolved along the way. So groundwater perhaps will flow down to great depths before it emerges back into a, a fallen basin. In a rift basin, we might have mantle fluid coming up through faults and fractures. We might have compression and expulsion of formational fluid. Um, we may be dealing with evaporated seawater or seawater. Um, and the underlying geology um, might be controlling the actual architecture of our own carbonate plants. So there are many, many reasons why we need to step back first and foremost and think about the biggest possible scale before we zoom into the details. So where did I start with all this? Um, so I started on the very small scale. Um, my, ba my background was a, a, is that I took a BSc in um, geology at the University of Birmingham. Um, and one of the, the well, several of the courses were guys like David Vaughan and Rob Ixer, who taught us about um, mineralogy and very much from an economic point of view um, and the role of MVT mineralization um, and how it was hosted in carbonate sedimentary rocks. And I didn't think an enormous amount about this at the time, but then I ended up um, a couple of years after graduation up in Aberdeen, studying for a PhD under Gordon Walkton <clears throat> on the Carboniferous of the Derbyshire platform, where this paper um, originated from looking at mineralization within, um, the, uh, within the lower Carboniferous limestone. And specifically, I was looking at the calcite cements that were intergrown with barite and fluorite and galena mineralization that was hosted um, on the platform that we see here. And those of you who are in the UK or from the UK will know this location very well. This is Castleton. And this is the paleo reef front of the Carboniferous platform. And I'm gonna come back and talk about this a bit more later. Um, and then in the basin here, we have a succession of plastic sedimentary rocks, which sourced the fluids that were expelled onto the platform along faults and fractures and precipitated these minerals and also the intergrown calcite cements. And I spent the best part of three and a half years analysing in detail all of the calcite cements that were intergrown with those. And it essentially um, supported the model that Ixon and Vaughan presented that sedimentary basinal fluids um, were expelled um, very, very quickly during the brisk and erogenal through faults and fractures onto the platform leading to mineralisation. I then got a job um, with a company called Badley Ashton and Associates, um, who are UK geoscience consultancy for the oil and gas industry, who I spent six years with before I moved to Shell for about six years. And I spent much of that time, um, certainly at Badley Ashton, staring at large, large volumes of core, um, phenomenal volumes, miles and miles of core description. Um, it was a big step up from looking down the microscope and looking at cathode luminescence images. Um, it was a very steep learning curve, but I saw an enormous amount of Cretaceous carbonates, and I'll go on to say more about that too in a moment. What I didn't get to do was piece it together into a bigger sort of holistic picture, which was what I was missing. Um, and when I joined Shell and I was taught how to build geocellular models and had to think about how I represented um, all of these um, sedimentological and diagenetic um, features in two and 3D space, I learned a lot about what we know and what we don't know and how we might think about representing the subsurface so that we can simulate fluid flow. And it also forced me to talk a lot to reservoir engineers <coughs> about how they thought the subsurface worked and how simple or complex they thought it was. And also the interaction between fluids um, and not just water, but also oil and gas um, and different types of porosity and what that meant to oil and gas recovery and water flow, which I won't go into, but there's some rail phone curves here, an example of a model that we produced there to show how high permeability streaks lead to very fast rates of water flow and water breakthrough in carbonate reservoirs. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Arabian Flakes. Certainly, again, anybody who's worked on carbonates has probably had some interaction with um, the Arabian Plate at some point in their career. And it's a phenomenal um, region to work in. Um, this gives an idea of the sheer size and number of the oil and gas fields within the region, um, oil in green and gas in red. The fact that some of these fields are big enough to cross uh, national boundaries, um, that they, they are the biggest oil and gas fields in the world, um, and they've been on stream in production for decades and still perhaps only produce say 30% or so of their oil and gas, gives an idea of how, how big they are. And most of uh, that production has come from Upper Jurassic, Lower Cretaceous, and the very lower part of the Upper Cretaceous, for the most part, not all of it. 
And it's thanks to this combination of thick successions of carbonate sedimentary rocks interbedded with evaporites and clastics, which act as seals, um, clastics that can also act as source rocks, and the structuration that occurred um, during compression, um, during closure of the Neotethys and the uh, first and second alpine events, which created these um, fairly simple anticlinal and fault controlled anticlinal tracks. But the Cretaceous is also extremely interesting for another re reason. Um, it's a very long period of geological time, one of the hottest periods of the Phanerozoic, um, which is related principally to the high volumes of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere associated with the breakup of Gondwana and Pangaea. Um, and there was, uh, this area has become more important in recent years because of the development of sedimentary basins in the, in the, in the Atlantic as Atlantic rifting took place. But here we're just looking at this enormous empiric carbonate platform that developed on the Arabian plate up through North Africa and then for areas of southern Europe as well. And this was essentially one giant lagoon that was created from um, continental flooding that was associated with mel melting of the ice caps. And this was a very productive zone, um, very high levels of um, algal activity that created uh, micrite. Um, there was a lot of boring and micritization of grains created these slightly structureless grains because they've been so heavily altered on the seafloor. And because temperatures were so high, there was a fairly unique biota, um, including dominance of these large bivalves called rudists. Um, that's one that I'm just holding in my hand there. Um, and when we start looking at the, the fields in, in the Middle East, we see some fairly um, systematic regional trends. And uh, one of them is these high degrees of microporosity. So we see lots and lots of micropores. The blue in here is macroporosity. This is a one millimeter scale bar here. Lots of pores that you can't see in this as well in these brown areas. And we often see zones of porosity enhancement beneath unconformities, um, which has been variably related to um, ingress of meteoric water, but is probably also related to very late stage corrosion associated with uplift um, structuration hydrocarbon charge, of which there were at least two phases across the region at the time. That's a whole other seminar in itself, but the, the idea that there was porosity creation at unconformities is, is one um, idea that really we've started to sort of question quite seriously over the last uh, 20 years or so. What we don't really understand is how fluids come in quite uh, at this late stage and create so much pores. But what we do know when we start looking at the basal scale is that there was certainly a lot more structural activity um, going on than, than was first recognized when these fields were first mapped. And uh, this is an example from Q8, um, where we, uh, I had a PhD student looking at the Barra field here, which is a field that's not had um, particular success. It's actually very, um, very tight. Um, production has been very poor from it. Um, and when we went in and looked in detail at the seismic data, and matched it to the well data um, that we saw, and also some surface feature mapping, we found that there's these pipes um, that are generated through the field at a zone of structural complexity um, associated with these east-west faults, where there's been very clear evidence of fluid leakage um, from deep in, in the crust right through the reservoir that we we're looking at and up to the surface. And at the surface, we see um, mud volcanoes um, in particular as evidence of past fluid flow. So again, um, Small scale variations of porosity, very much controlled by large scale um, basin or structuration. But I'm going to go back now to the smaller scale and think uh, more about what a lot of people take as their bread and butter, which is um, analysis of the porosity and permeability of these rocks. So this is a, a fairly typical cross plot from an unnamed reservoir in an unknown field, but it's from the Cretaceous in the Middle East. And it shows um, one of the problems that many people struggle with with, um, with carbonate rocks. Um, if you're trying to do anything in the subsurface, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to produce oil and gas or whether you're trying to store carbon or whether you want to produce water, you need to know something about its porosity and its permeability. But you can't measure permeability downhole, um, not for, certainly not through wildland logging tools. You can only use pump tests. And so it's very useful if you can predict permeability from porosity. And when you plot porosity versus permeability for carbonate rocks, you end up with this huge scatter. So each of these plugs, um, each of these points is one plug, which is about five centimeters. Um, so there's a scale issue here. 
Um, but we see that for any given porosity, we have a permeability range of several orders of magnitude. And this is, to, if we start to break this down, um, a function of these many different features here. I've not named all of them, but we might have biological controls and microporosity, um, dissolution to create molds and bugs that gives large port to rate ratios, dolomitization, recrystallization, cementation, fracturing. So there's lots and lots of different controls within this plot that means simple um, interpretation of flow properties of carbonate rocks um, are really often not possible. So I started thinking about this way back in my, my time uh, um, at Badley Ashton, and this, is, this has evolved through, through the time, and it's thinking about um, poor evolution pathways and, and, and the idea of inheritance um, of, of particular di diagenetic features. So if you take a simple oolitic grainstone, which is uh, an example of a Jurassic um, oolitic grainstone here, and in this case, these oolites were sat on the seafloor and for the most part underwent some element of alteration through boring and necrotization. And this created um, these microporous grains. The, gray, the green is microporosity, is what we see here in this slide. And in the process of microtizing them, some of the fluids diffused out and started to fill the intervening pore spaces with calcite. And so you can end up with a rock where you have very soft grains that compact very easily, such as we see here, with intervening occlusion of the macroporosity with calcite cements. And if you allow that process to continue, you end up with a rock that is a very poor porosity and very low permeability. However, if you manage to get that grainstone off the seafloor and buried very, very quickly, perhaps in an area of high um, production and deposition, high deposition rates, then you inhibit that microtization process um, bury it quickly, maybe is even slightly overpressured, and then hydrocarbon comes in quickly, preserves the pore space, and you have a good reservoir rock such as this. All of these rocks, or well, these two rocks particularly, have very similar porosities, both somewhere around the 30 to 35 percent mark, but clearly the one on the left here has much better permeability than the one on the right. And that means that we also have to think not just about the actual porosity, but also size of the pores, the shape of the pores, the connectivity of the pores. And we've been able to do this a lot more easily uh, in the last 10, 20 years or so because of the advent of um, high resolution X-ray CT scanning, which complements what we've already been able to do with thin sections and SEM um, later in two dimensions. So if we take a rock like this, these aren't all the same rock, but something like this, a, a, a rudest rich um, Cretaceous grainstone, we look at in thin section, we see these very um, complex pores, these very complex bugs, um, and they have very, in some places very narrow constrictions, very high pore widths, and we see a similar thing on a small scale. We have a microfracture with leaching around that to create these very irregular um, pore shapes, which we can now describe um, using different pore shape parameters. Uh, and here's a 3D um, scan of a very small piece of rock. This is a 200 micron scale. And we can extract that um, pore network and we can analyze those pore sizes. And when we do so, um, and when we're even lucky enough to simulate fluid flow, sorry, in um, 3D, I'm not going to be able to, hang on. So I have to change my pointer. Um, we can uh, run flow simulations which show us that actually the elongation of the pore, the aspect ratio of the pore, is fundamentally important to how fluids flow through these. So this is a very small piece of rock. Um, the whole thing is only a few millimetres in length. It was saturated with water, um, which you can't see, and the blue is oil. And when we flow oil through it, let's do it again, we see that the oil goes preferentially into the big pores and those pores that are more elongate. And we get these little jumps as it finds a connected network and breaks through up, there's one there, and one there, and it breaks through up to the top. And we see a similar process when we try and produce the oil and flood it with water. So even on a very, very small scale, we're conscious of this heterogeneity. Which takes me um, already, because a lot of that work was done at the University of Manchester, so some work I've been doing um, over the last uh, 10 years or so, um, at which point I want to acknowledge a lot of these people here, and I'm not going to name them all, but um, Rob Gawthorpe, Hilary Corbett, Fiona Whitaker, um, at the Rotterdam and Peter Burgess um, have all made very significant contributions to what I'm going to show you next as part of some of the industry funded projects that we've been running um, here 
um, from, from Manchester, and this is an array of our, our PhD students. And what we've been trying to do as part of this work is really try and look at this holistic approach to understanding the integrated controls of structure, sedimentation, diagenesis and fluid flow. And a simple way to start thinking about this is to go back to the seismic data and look at structural controls on carbonate platform growth. Um, and this is a seismic volume from a Triassic succession in Northwest Australian shelf. Um, and this is a Synrift succession, um, which when we strip it back, we can see we see carbon isolated carbonate platforms. Each one of these is about a kilometre across, developing on the earliest stages of the football. And as rifting continued and we start to get these little fault blocks developed, we started to get the biggest platforms developed on the um, highest point of the foot wall. And then in the hanging wall dip slope, we see pinnacles starting to develop um, and trying to keep up with sea level and usually failing. And then in the final stages um, of rifting, as the um, offset was taken up by this major crustal lineament over uh, on this right hand side here, we see these platforms starting to drown and uh, eventually the whole system was drowned out and flooded by plastics. So that's a really nice example of structural controls on sedimentation in a fairly simple way. What we've then tried to do is take this forward into, into some forward models and these are CarboCat models that Peter Burgess has developed at the University of Liverpool. And we um, tried to, to build a whole series of models with uh, Isabella Massiero, his PhD student, looking at different slip rates, at different connectivities along faults, ice house, greenhouse systems. Um, and there's a whole, there's many, many scenarios that we've modeled here. But the point is, is that you can start to think about the structural controls on sedimentation combined with different degrees of sea level fluctuation associated with ice house and greenhouse settings. For example, you can play around them with different um, carbonate factories, different water depths, um, um, different plastic influxes, and see what the resultant platforms look like. And we've tried to apply this um, uh, on the lower Carboniferous in the UK, because this is where I'm a lot of history, it's on our doorstep. Um, it's uh, thankfully in times like this, it makes field work a lot easier to organize. Um, but it's also an area that's got a lot of research behind it, not least by um, Rob Gawthorpe and Al Fraser, who established um, very nicely the structural evolution of the basin way back in the 1990s, which they republished in 2003 in a very nice Gilsop memoir. And it shows that these carbonate platforms that developed within a very shallow sea um, uh, in a fairly um, restricted basin um, developed on the foot wall highs of crustal lineaments that have been reactivated from the Caledonian orogeny. Um, and some of them were land attached and some of them were more isolated platforms out in the basin. And there's been discussions for years going back into the 80s as to well, how important, how important is the tectonic control and sedimentation, how important the relative sea level changes and what else is going on, what other environmental factors are uh, controlling sedimentation. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that this sits at a very important period of Earth history where we're going from um, a greenhouse to an ice house phase. Um, and there's been a lot of um, discussion as to when the ice house um, conditions really kicked in. It probably wasn't until the Pennsylvanian, about 280 billion years ago. But there were certainly perturbations before that where we see fluctuations in heating and cooling. Um, and there's been suggestions that some of those um, ice house cycles began back in the lower carboniferous in the, in the Visayan, which is the interval that we're looking at. So there is some suggestion in the global literature of, a, of an ice house event around in the Tournasian, and there's also been suggestions that this sits into the Visayan as well. And this is what these platforms look like. Um, the EC4 is, is, sits in the lowermost Visayan. Um, the EC5 is, is, is this succession here in the, cent in the middle of the Visayan. And this was a very healthy carbonate platform. We see stacked up with shallow successions um, capped by emergent. So essentially what we see between the EC5 and the EC6 is a real degradation in the quality of the platform. And we move from a very healthy platform to one that looks decidedly sad, um, thin bedded, dominated by brachiopods. And so first let's look at this apparent cyclicity in the Asbin. When we do that, we run some forward models and some statistical analysis um, coupled with um, outcrop logging, again using some software that Pete's developed in Liverpool. We start to find that actually the stratal stacking patterns 
Um, and in particular, the continuity um, and distribution of these lovely paleosols that we see here um, are really not as ordered and predictable as we first, first thought. So maybe things aren't quite as cyclic as we first thought, and maybe um, those eustatic variations are perhaps having less of a control than, than has been suggested. There are certainly um, tectonic controls on the basin at the same time, but there's also this degradation in the quality of the platform as well. And this is the Derbyshire platform, which is age equivalent to the one I just showed you. And we see, this, again, this nice, healthy reef rim platform, um, which is, this is Winnett's Pass near Castleton in the, um, in the lowermost, um, uh, in the EC5 and the Visayan, nice, healthy, diverse fauna. When we get into the EC6 at the top, we see that the platform's starting to shrink. And again, we're starting to get this dominance of brachiopods in here. And so there seems to be something happening environmentally within this basin as well at this time. And I don't have any um, clear answers for you at the moment, but I think the important thing to take away from all of this is that um, there is no single answer, that the tectonic controls on sedimentation uh, are demonstrable. There was definitely global changes taking place in terms of sea level and perhaps in ocean chemistry, but that there were actually some local environmental controls taking place that were influencing the platform at the same time. Right, this would have been a good time to break, but anyway, we will now move on to the second part. Um, let's do a quick time check where I'm going to talk about dolomitization. And this is um, at face value a little bit of a change from, from what I've just been talking about, which was structural controls on, on platform architecture. But really, until you understand the platform architecture, it's very difficult to understand what's happening in terms of dolomitization on the platform and certainly to predict where that dolomitization is taking place and why. So we've learned a lot about dolomitization, um, again, with the advent of, of modeling, um, particularly reactive transport modeling. Um, Fiona's group in Bristol have done an enormous amount of work um, modeling dolomitization, looking at sensitivities. Um, there's also been some very interesting work done um, experimentally, looking at dolomitization processes um, in the last 10 years or so. And what we're fairly certain of now is that this is a dissolution reprecipitation reaction. So the, the, the limestone is dissolving and then very quickly reprecipitating as crystalline dolomite. And sometimes it does that in such a way that it preserves the original fabric of the rock, such as we see here, but often it destroys the texture completely and we, we have no record of what the rock type was originally. Um, sometimes the dolomitization is partial and we're left with some limestone and some dolomite. And these models are telling us that we need to think about a lot of things when we think about how dolomitization has happened, where it might happen and how extensive it might be. Um, acidity is important, temperature is very important. The warmer it gets, the easier it is. Usually we need to be putting a large volume of fluid through the system. We need a reactive rock, um, ideally with a high reactive surface area, which means um, lots and lots of, uh, of nuclei may be micrite for it to react with. Um, and brine salinity, higher brine salinity is also help. But when you start reading um, around, um, there are still many papers. Um, I'm not saying that they're the majority, but there are still many papers that tend to push um, their, their interpretations into one of three models, and usually one of two models. Um, and that is the idea that um, Dolomitization takes place from the reflux of concentrated seawater. My, my box has slipped here, it should be over here. Um, and that, that essentially is through evaporation of seawater, sinking of dense brines and dolomitization of the rocks underneath it. And that's a near surface reaction that takes place very soon after deposition. The other is that dolomitization takes place in the burial environment, so-called burial or hydrothermal dolomitization, which was very much um, a thing uh, back in the early 2000s, and I'm going to say a lot more about this um, in a moment. The area that's received perhaps less attention, but is still quite important, is this notion of, of cahoot convection or geothermal convection, where cold water is pulled into the platform, um, warmed, convects, and dolomitizes the platform margin. And there's absolutely nothing fundamentally wrong with these models. It's just that, um, as you might expect, they're not always as simple as that, and it may be not appropriate to try and shoehorn interpretations into uh, one or, or, or more of these. 
So let's look first um, at subtitle um, shallow water dogmatization, near surface dogmatization. Uh, one of the first things that the, the model of, of reflux dogmatization suggests is that you need um, evaporated brines for this to occur. And uh, uh, that would suggest that you would get um, uh, intubated evaporites or at least evidence of evaporation in platforms that are basically dogmatized. And that often is true if you look at the Arab formation in, um, on the Arabian plate, for example, then you get dogmatized strata within what was clearly an evaporated basin, so like salt and anhydrite without. But this is a, a, an example from the Cretaceous. Um, this is the Cenomane Mediterranean in um, Tunisia. And I'm going to go back to finding my pointer. Um, and you can see thin bedded, um, very shallow water strata. Um, there's then a, a, a slight uh, flooding here, and then we go back into a very healthy platform above it. And the whole thing is pervasively dolomitized. There's one bed of gypsum that we found and very little else. There's not much evidence of evaporation at all. And in the same age strata, St. Cenomane Mediterranean in southern Spain, we see something very, very similar. We see pervasive dolomitization over hundreds of kilometers um, in the case of this example, and um, maybe about 100 kilometers in this case, um, and no evidence of, of evaporites at all. So this suggests that we can dolomitize large areas of, of carbonate platforms using near normal sea water, maybe slightly, slightly more saline, but certainly not hypersaline. The other thing that we can do when we start mapping out our stratal geometries, and I apologize that this is a bit schematic, but um, it demonstrates the point that, that in the middle Cenomanian on this platform, we had reflux of, uh, of these uh, mesohaline brines from the north to the south. The ramp had a north-south polarity, and we see a decrease in dolomitization as we move to the south. Um, and at the top of that sequence, this user day 2.4 sequence, we see de-dolomitization. And from Biostrat, we, we, this, this whole period in time probably lasted about a million years. So we know that we probably dolomitized the platform within about a million years, and then we de-dolomitized it, we calcitized it. The platform then underwent a structural reorganization that was tilting, and the polarity changed from south to north. And at that point, the fluid started fluxing from south to north and dolomitizing um, in that direction, so that the extent of the dolomitization dies out as you move northward so that we see that the platform responded very, very quickly to changes in its structural orientation. So we can use this basin scale data again to help us map out areas of dolmatization and think about uh, the types of fluids and the amount of time it was taking to, to replace the rock. I'm now gonna move more to what I would call fault controlled dolmatization, um, but which has uh, traditionally been, taught, been called hydrothermal dolomite. And, uh, this is a very contentious term because this is a term that um, was coined very, uh, by Davis and Smith in 2006 in their APG paper quite freely to describe um, dolomite that is hot, um, the important, or was precipitated from hot fluids. The important point is that these fluids have to be significantly hotter than the host rock. Um, and in some cases, um, there's, there's been a bit of a misnomer. The other association with what many people call hydrothermal dolomite is that it tends to form around faults. And the notion back in around 2006 was that these hot fluids were coming up faults and they were forming these Christmas tree type bodies um, around the faults. Um, and we were seeing areas of brecciation um, and so forth associated with it. And with that background, um, my, we, we set up a project working in Hamon which is in uh, Sinai. It's just between uh, Sinai City and Sharm El Sheikh, in an area that Rob Gawthorpe had been doing lots of work um, for many years on the rift evolution. So we knew a lot about the tectonic stratigraphic framework. Um, and these are dolomite bodies in an Eocene rock. Um, and we can see that there are two types of bodies. There's this massive body here that we're seeing in red that's sitting uh, next to these hot springs. And then there's these purple bodies here that's sitting out um, in this direction, um, which we're calling strata-bound dolomite bodies. And our original idea when we started this project was that these were fluids that had come up the fault, formed these bodies here, these red bodies, and then gone on to flow out and form these purple strata-bound bodies. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the field. Um, we see this almost Christmas tree-like structure, and it's about 80 meters high. And, um, this particular area is a few hundred meters across in diameter. 
But when we started to look, if I just go back to that previous um, image, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, um, we see that these strata bound bodies are offset by this fault. And this started to raise a few alarm bells with us because we thought, well, you know, we, we knew when this fault terminated based on other strata relationships. And it would suggest that the strata bound bodies might have formed before the massive ones. And when we ran some strontium isotope dates, we found that that was the case. And the strata bound bodies were indeed um, tied in with the earliest sin rift, whereas the massive dolomite bodies over here were much younger and were formed in the Miocene, and that there have been multiple phases of fluid flux, which we certainly found evidence for in our petrographic data. And so we created um, uh, some conceptual models about how this might have happened with fluids flowing down faults from the seafloor, convecting along a basal plastic aquifer, and then coming back up and evolving fault to form the strata band dolomite. And then during the latter phase, that flow was concentrating along what became the major bounding fault, the Hamann Fran fault. And we were getting in fault plane convection of seawater to give us those dolomite bodies. And we thought that that might well be a valid interpretation because we were finding that these dolomite bodies sat at the position of a number of hot springs down the coast, which also coincide with the transfer zones along the fault where the polarity of the fault dips changed. So Fiona went ahead and um, has a PhD student, um, Sam Bacon-Core, who's, who's just finishing up now, try and model that fault plane convection. And he's, uh, he's found through these models, and this is a a kilometre scale model here, I've lost my scale here, this is about two kilometres across. Um, he found that by um, convecting cool seawater down faults which were heated from underneath, we could create, or he could create, these dolomite bodies such as we see here, a, a particular sort of an optimal zone within the fault. So this suggests that fault plane convection of fluids um, is, is really something that might be quite import, important, that it just needs some sort, normal seawater and it needs heat coming up from underneath. So what happens if we go back to where the whole concept of hydrothermal dolomitization first originated in the West Canada sedimentary basin? Um, and this was the, the area that um, um, the Graham Davis worked in when he wrote his, his paper with Tory Smith back in 2006. And here we see um, these classic Christmas tree type bodies um, marked out in, in sort of this, this reddy brown colour against the limestone. This is a Cambrian succession just on the edge of the, uh, the National Park in Alberta. Um, and I've had um, now my third PhD student working on this with Hilary Corbett at McEwen University. And these are what most people think of as hydrothermal dolomites. They're smashed to bits, they're brecciated, all the white in here in saddle dolomite. There's clasps of dolomite floating within here. And when we look in, um, uh, in detail um, around some of these faults, so there's a fault coming down up through here, we see zebra dolomites, so these, these um, very um, unique textures that you get in hydrothermal dolomites of this striped effect of replacive dolomite and saddle dolomite cement. So all of this screams out as classic hot saline brines coming up through faults um, and dolomitizing the rock. So we went out there to look at this and to see whether our ideas from Hammond Fran really held up in this setting and also to look specifically at reaction fronts. So I'm going to show you a photo now from where the arrow is. Um, and this is one of these nice limestone to dolomite reaction fronts. So this is the limestone in grey and the dolomite in brown through here. And you can see that the dolomite just appears to terminate. Um, and nobody's really looked at dolomite reaction fronts before. Um, and so I had a student, um, Ardi Prashtayatala, who's uh, published this uh, recent, just this year, map out in detail the changes that are taking place across the reaction front. And what he's found here and in other reaction fronts is that the transition from the limestone to the pure dolomite um, is usually has this halo zone on the edge where there's quite a high degree of porosity. And we see these dolomite, uh, well-formed dolomite crystals um, sitting and floating within a more porous matrix. And when he ran clumped isotopes around here, he also found that there was a decrease in temperature as we went from uh, the core of the dolomite body to the margins. And this suggested to us that actually the whole um, reaction front was a, was a paleo feature that, was over, uh, that progressively backstepped as the fluids uh, retreated. Um, and the, they retreated because the porosity was becoming increasingly closed off. 
He then since done a lot of work, particularly Jack Stacey, who's in the process of writing up his PhD now, on the geochemistry of the dolomite itself. And when we look at that in detail, um, we find that the, the geochemistry is quite an odd, odd mixture of, of marine type signatures when we look at the trace elements, but also some very, very hot fluids when we look at the clumped isotope signatures and the, the stable isotope um, uh, comp uh, compositions of the, the water that precipitated the calcite, we find that it has very, very high salinities, more than 20 weight percent and um, temperatures up to around 200 degrees centigrade. And this area is underlain by um, a, a, a thick crust of serpentinite, which is one way in which you might um, release magnesium if that serpentinite has come into contact with carbon dioxide. And um, coupled with finding um, dolomite cement within this aquifer here, we find that um, we, we, we would suggest that these dolomite bodies didn't form a depth at all, but formed from extremely hot fluids that were coming up from um, this serpentinite and this deep crustal basement along the faults. They were mixing with seawater at the surface and also convecting through this underlying sandstone aquifer here. And support for this model comes from some recent work on the Burgess Shale, um, Cathedral formation is just slightly older than the Burgess Shale. Um, and that's suggesting that many of the, um, the organisms that are thriving in the Burgess Shale um, are thriving around hot springs that were coming up through faults, um, which would suggest that there was a very um, active thermal system operating at the time. So the main message here is, is that the fault plane convection seems to be working in this case too, and it also seems to be invo involving marine fluids as well as deep saline fluids that are coming up um, and venting at the surface. What happened subsequently was that this section was buried, it was sealed by the Stephen Formation, which is essentially the Burgess Shale, and it very quickly became overpressured, and that there was then brecciation, um, and formation of zebra dolomites, but that this was all forming within a kilometre of burial, and that these are not deep burial features at all, but they happened very, very early on um, in the depositional history of these rocks. And it also raises questions around the interaction of hot, deep fluids with other volcanics. And if we go back to the Derbyshire platform, um, we also start to see evidence of convection of seawater facilitated by um, volcanic um, activity at the time, and also interaction of um, fluids with, um, with those lavas to uh, create an additional source of magnesium. So I'm going to finish now with a little bit of a look forward and uh, much of what I've shown you has been focused on the Cretaceous, not all of it, I've talked about the Cambrian and the Carboniferous as well, but I want to go back um, particularly to this point here, the Cenomanian Turanian boundary and the reason I'm coming back to this is it's one that I've seen in a number of different um, settings. I've looked at it in Oman um, where it's equivalent to the Natty B formation, we've looked at it in Spain where we have this thin um, carbonate platform here called the Santa Fe and Pradina, and we've also looked at it in the uh, Iberian Basin, that first example I showed you of shallow dolomitization, where the carbonate platform completely disappears and is replaced by this mud rock. And the reason why this is important is that it coincides with one of the oceanarctic events, one of the major oceanarctic events that took place in the Cretaceous. And when you look at this um, succession of carbonate platforms here in the Iberian Basin, you can see how thin this carbonate platform is compared to the ones that formed later in the Cretaceous, particularly the Terragates platform here. And this is a warning for us. Um, we, I mentioned right at the start of this, if you can remember back to an hour ago, the importance of carbonates of, as, as, as um, proxies of um, past climatic events um, and um, changes in seawater chemistry and changes in atmospheric conditions through time. What we're seeing today is a number of features that really should um, give us cause for concern, and I'm sure most of you are, are very well aware of these. We're seeing uh, blooms of coccoliths down in the Southern Ocean. With increasing temperatures, we're seeing ocean acidity increase, and it's leading to sh shell dissolution um, and uh, a lowering of calcification. And we're seeing rising temperatures contributing to coral bleaching. Essentially, we're seeing our carbonate system under stress. And this is exactly what was happening here this point here. These carbonate platforms that have thrived in warm shallow seas that were a result of high concentrations of carbon dioxide eventually reached a tipping point where they couldn't thrive anymore 
and they started to go into the decline. So there's a very big lesson for us here in the future and something that we need to think about um, as we move forward as geologists. And that really puts us into the position of thinking about what's our role in trying to uh, help with this energy transition and help us move to net zero carbon. Well, certainly we've um, got an opportunity through carbon sequestration and storage to help to bring some of that carbon back out of the atmosphere and perhaps to store it in carbonate reservoirs. Um, there's certainly been a lot of discussion around the viability of carbon storage in carbonate reservoirs, but for those of you who came to the Carbonate Forum in May, Martin Blunt gave a very good yeah, he made a very good case for um, how carbon storage can be uh, um, administered within carbonate reservoirs. Um, this is a, a, at the top here, a, a study that uh, was conducted with a student at, at the University of Manchester in a naturally CO2 rich reservoir, uh, which showed that um, natural carbon um, ingress into the formation resulted in a large amount of calcite cementation, which allows us to basically bind up the carbon and store it. Carbonates are also very important potentially for geothermal energy. They're obviously not going to produce water like this, which is um, from Giza in Iceland, but the lower carboniferous limestone that I've spent a lot of time talking about today is a primary target for low entropy heat source in the UK um, and hopefully can provide some answers at least for local heating um, in this country and it also has um, already gone on stream in, in the Netherlands. And then there are some slightly more diverse, perhaps, solutions. Um, Jack Stacey's just published um, a piece of work on the Devonian um, of the West Canada Sedimentary Basin as part of his PhD. And he found that in the Dolomites, um, that he was looking at very high concentrations of lithium, um, which has been noted also by other people um, that the poor waters are very rich in lithium. And so um, potentially there's, there's um, sources of, of lithium for, for batteries and for energy futures coming out of waters that are hosted in in carbonate reservoirs. So hopefully um, I haven't bamboozled you completely. I think the point I just want to make now at the end is that we've moved away from some of our traditional um, workspaces. Um, we all love going in the field. Many of us like looking down microscopes. Many of us love geochemistry. That isn't going to go away. Um, but carbonate sedimentology now requires um, a much more diverse approach, a multi-scaled approach, and also one that involves integration of different types of data, models, um, integration of, of seismic analysis, um, forward models and retrospective models as well. Um, and that will bring us opportunities to help use our knowledge um, to harness um, not just traditional energies, but also to, to repurpose it into, into future energies as well. And with that, I shall finish just with a thank you. Um, I knew I, I couldn't get everybody in here, but these are some of my PhD students from the last few years. Um, much of their work's featured in here. Um, and also the Basins Group at Manchester who collaborated on a lot of this and uh, very much helped to uh, develop some of this research. So I'd like to say a very big thank you to them. Um, and I'm more than happy to take questions now. Super, thank you so much, Kathy, for that wonderful talk. Um, I think you've helped hit home that carbonates are anything but simple, um, but also important for our future moving forward and some action steps. So um, guys, you can type now in the chat with any questions that you have for Kathy. Um, in the meantime, I have a question for you regarding the, yep. the poro perm plot. Um, and you mentioned that there's such a large scatter in terms of uh, values for carbonates. Mm. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you can mention or say about how we can start to reduce some of that scatter, like uh, depositional facies or something along those lines to help give people a better idea how to move forward with that type of data. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I could. I mean, it, it, it is a bit of the holy grail. Um, and you know, I've, I've been, I've, I've been thinking about this for, for 20 years, and maybe I'm just not up to the task because I don't have any easy solution. Um, I think multiple data sets are really, really important. Um, just relying on the poroperm is, is, is insufficient. Um, I think most petrophysicists don't just rely on the poroperm, of course, you know, there's many different ways of looking at it. But I think you do have to strip it back. Um, you do have to think about what almost what every individual point is showing and, and take that approach of thinking about the pathways that the individual rocks have followed. The problem is, is that's time consuming. In, a, in an industry environment, that, that, that becomes something that takes up a lot of people's time and effort and it's not straightforward. 
um, what we have found through our image analysis is that if you start to create poriperm relationships where you take into account not just total porosity but pore shape, pore size, things that you can measure, aspect ratio for example, um, you can get to a much closer match. So if you can find a way whereby you understand which fasces or which diagenetic rock type, whatever you want to call it, has a specific pore structure, then you might in your individual, individual cases be able to get to a more predictive model. Um, I think we definitely have to move away from total porosity. We have to really think about what it is that's contributing to that permeability. No questions? Okay, here, here we go. Uh, Sangeeta has a, the first question for you, Kathy. She says, that was a great talk, thank you. My question is, if dolomite is found within ancient terrestrial carbonate deposits, can it be said that the paleo temperature was hotter or that the environment maybe uh, was a hot spring? And she is uh, joining us from India. Fantastic. That's a really, really good question. Um, and I think the simple answer is yes, probably. Um, you, would want to, you would want to try and sample it, and, and you know, whether it's pumped isotopes or fluid inclusions or something, but there is some data starting to come through now where we're seeing dolomites in the Kustrine settings that do indeed seem to be associated with, with hot water coming up faults. Um, the, the, the challenge is always finding the source of the magnesium. Um, so it almost doesn't matter what the rock is. Um, as long as you can get some get some magnesium in there and, and perhaps you know a bit of bit of heat to get the reaction going is is helpful. Yeah. So I'll have a spin off quick spin off question for that. Um, do you want to mention anything about the role of microbes in <laughs> the formation of dolomite instead of having to have necessarily that super hot fluid or in, intensely you know enriched magnesium? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a fair point. Now, I've deliberately steered away from microbes. Um, mm. Microbes are important, for sure, and they, they certainly um, contribute to getting, um, getting these reactions started. And I, I think that, I, I didn't say that quite so clearly in there, but, but having some sort of seed for dolomitization is really, really important. And, and um, that initial nucleation um, can be microbially mediated. And, and once you've got a seed and you can allow it to grow, then um, you, you've got something that can, can develop from there. Um, as well as being a dissolution precipitation reaction, dolomite, you know, there's a lot of recrystallization that takes place. And, and, and Steve Kazmarek's work has shown this really nicely in the lab, that what's initially precipitated is not what you see at the end, that, that you stabilize it. So um, microbes are often very important in getting a very high magnesium calcite um, developed, which can become dolomite, which can then recrystallize into a into more stable form of, of dolomite. And of course, in a lacustrine setting, then yes, of course, you could have microbes in there contributing to that too, but they might well be thriving because of the hot water coming up the spring. Yeah. Okay. I think there's, a, there's an enormous amount to be done, of work to be done with microbes. Um, I'm definitely not the person to do it. But uh, yeah, I think we've learned a lot about their, their role um, over the last uh, decade or so. Definitely. Yes, <laughs> Stephen said yeah. it's timely to revisit um, and reassess some of those uh, classic outcrops. Yes, absolutely. Agreed. Yeah, I also really enjoyed seeing um, sort of your guys' newly proposed model with the, um, the cells, the circulation cells, and how you can deliver some of those hot fluids and recirculate and reheat them and deliver them elsewhere. Um, so I, I like that, that interpretation. and. Um, yeah, bringing that to different outcrops is definitely something that, that should be done in the future. Thank you. Yes, I think, I mean, Fiona, Fiona Whitaker's really sort of um, pushed this quite hard as a hydrogeologist. Um, I think hydrogeologists are very comfortable with the idea that fluids go down faults as well as up them. Um, but it's taken us a long time to get that concept on board ourselves. And um, it's been very nice to see that modeled. Um, Again, hydrogeologists have, have, have demonstrated it for years, I think, in, in sort of big scale basin models, but we've, we've probably ignored it on peril. All right, we have a comment from John Reimer joining us from Saudi Arabia. Hi, John. Um, he says, don't you think the future will be a microbial carbonate platform world? I think it could well be. I think if we take the Cretaceous as our, um, our case study for that, um, I mean, certainly the, the you know, the, the, the Schweiber, um, the lithocodium blooming in the Schweiber formation was definitely an indication of what can happen um, when our CO2 
get too high. So yeah, it could be getting very slimy in the future. All right, one more question from Ricardo, um, who says, very nice and thoughtful talk, Kathy. Thanks uh, also for your perspective. After careful, carefully hearing your talk, it seems that the progress needs to be very holistic. Don't you think um, there's a way of compartmentalizing knowledge has prevented us from detecting more hydrothermal influence in dolomitized travertine tufas, even in our traditionally marine settings with extensional settings? And he's yeah. joining us from Argentina. Yeah, yeah, I would agree entirely. And um, I have a, a, a colleague at University of Manchester, Stefan Schroeder, who's been working <coughs> On, uh, on some of these aspects in um, um, Angola, and, and the, the, I've only had um, a, a little bit of oversight of some of that, but, but I would agree, yeah, that certainly hydrothermal systems and, and dolomitization there is, is very important. I mean, I, 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 if, if you get nothing else from this, I think it is that we have to be holistic and we have to be thinking about the whole system and, and process. Great. Yeah, I think a lot of us can get very micro scale. Um, yes. And I'm definitely guilty of that, <laughs> but it's a nice reminder to sort of bring different perspectives into the game as well as different types of analyses. So. Yeah. I would say um, that there is a huge amount of importance in keeping that micro scale focus because the flip side of being too big a scale is that you perhaps macro sample too much and you um, ignore some of the details that get hidden. Um, so a good example would be if you're drilling for um, isotopes for paleo climate analysis or something like that, that you really need to understand what diagenetic changes have taken place on a very small scale to avoid making wrong interpretations from bulk data. Yep, absolutely. All right, one more, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> one more uh, comment from Kevin, who's joining us from the Philippines. Um, he wants to know if there's any correlation between the age of the carbonates and the uh, dolomitization. Yeah, that's, that, that's also a very good question. I think that th there have been attempts in the past to do this and to suggest that perhaps dolomitization thrives during greenhouse periods, for example, um, when there's uh, large amounts of evaporation. So a good example would be the Permo Trias, um, massive um, development of evaporitic basins and huge, you know, sort of basin scale dolomitization. Um, but then equally, if you look at the Cretaceous, um, there are large areas of Cretaceous current platforms with no dolomite whatsoever. Um, and the two examples I showed of Cenomanian to Turanian platforms that were dolomitized were slightly further north of the, of the equator and you know, perhaps a slightly more arid climate belt. So I think, yes, as magnesium calcium ratio of seawater has changed through time, there is you know, greater and lesser diagenetic potential, but I don't think those simple rules are as easy to pull out as we first thought that they were. So maybe more so uh, um, due to a shift in uh, seawater chemistry more so than the duration of burial of a particular. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. All right, well, unless we have any last questions from anybody. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. What a wonderful talk. Um, thank you for really it. Yeah. And thank for you all And for, for all of our listeners out there, make sure and come back next week for, um, for the next Eds Online seminar. And don't forget that it will be actually earlier, a lot earlier. It will be at 9 a.m. instead of 4, um, as our speaker will be joining us from Australia. So um, again, thank you very much, Kathy, and also to the IES for the sponsorship of Sets Online. And check out the website for all of the, um, the recorded webinars, as well as other aspects for teaching resources. And we will see you next week. <laughs>